The Unshackled Waves, episode 112. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. One of the most contentious social issues it seems in Australia is that of feminism and men's rights. Feminists in Australia have captured our media and political class, which they use to push their pet causes of the domestic violence epidemic, rape culture, the gender wage gap and male privilege. And if you question any of their statistics or claims, you are labelled a misogynist. Meanwhile, any attempt to discuss men's issues is dismissed and ridiculed, as we saw with the media treatment of uh, Cassie J, director of the men's rights movie The Red Pill, when she was in Australia to speak at the International Conference on Men's Issues on the Gold Coast earlier this year. Her publicist for her tour was Bettina Arndt, who has been one of Australia's most prominent men, men's rights activists and critics of the modern feminist movement. She regularly appears on Sky News programs and speaks at a number of public policy events. In addition to her media work, her day job is she is an online dating coach and was known as one of Australia's first sex therapists in the 1970s, where she edited for a magazine. She is a qualified clinical psychologist and has published several books, most recently The Sex Diaries and What Met Want in Bed. We thought we'd invite her on today to not just discuss the current gender issues, but also uh, men, women, dating and sex more broadly. Bettina, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tim. Now, you're considered, I'm not sure if you're comfortable with the term, you're considered a conservative commentator, but you actually have quite a uh, racy history. You're one of Australia's first uh, sex therapists. I've heard that a lot in uh, other interviews uh, that, that I've watched you in. That's how you're described. But I've always been curious, what does a sex therapist actually do? Oh, look, I was a sex therapist for about a minute 40 years ago. <laughs> it's a long time ago. Um, well, I was originally a clinical psychologist and, and then uh, decided to specialise in sex therapy. And you're far too young, Tim, to know this, but this was back in the 1970s and it was a time when you weren't allowed to talk publicly about sex at all. There was no information. People were incredibly ignorant about it. And a lot of my job was actually just giving people sexual information. Um, I start a sex therapist works with people and deals with sexual problems. But in actual fact, um, at that time, the biggest problem was just lack of information and people's embarrassment and discomfort with sex. And so a lot of what I did was just giving them the facts to, getting them, to get them to feel comfortable talking about sex. And I'm, I constantly run into people of my sort of age who say, you taught me everything I know. You know? So that's what I did. I, I made a very deliberate decision. I was actually working as a therapist for a little while, but just made a decision to use the media and to go out in the media and teach people about sex. So I'd spent I did a master's research on teaching women to become orgasmic. And I sat there with woman after woman saying, well, there's this thing called the clitoris here, you know, telling them the basic stuff they should know. Um, and then I thought, this is madness. I have to get on television and say, this is the clitoris, <laughs> which is what I did. And I had 10 years in Australia talking about um, sex on television and radio. I had two years banned from live television and radio because they just the, the authorities decided it was all too much um i wasn't so, and they couldn't even ever tell me what i'd said that was wrong it was just you know i talked about things like masturbation i talked about topics you weren't allowed to talk about then uh, and i had my own radio program and I, so i had a very racy beginning and that confuses people when they want to put me in this conservative box because i'm certainly not conservative when it comes to sex amongst other things uh, and I actually regard myself as forward thinking and the, the rabid left who are stuck in the feminism of the 1970s, are they're the ones who are conservative in my view. They haven't moved on beyond that sort of crazy gender politics, which is holding us all back. And today you're uh, a dating coach, uh, more specifically an online dating coach. Uh, uh, w without giving uh, too much of your trade secrets away, uh, what are the mistakes that people make with dating that uh, might make them 
come to, come to you for advice? Well, I, I mean, that all started because friends started coming to me and asking for help with their profiles. And this is not so much on Tinder, but on the, you know, the profiles where you have to actually write a proper introduction to yourself. And a lot of people find that very difficult. I work mainly with people over 50. I mean, although I have 30-year-olds and 20-year-olds, but most young people, I say, go, go on to Tinder, go on to one of the phone apps where you don't have to put much information. And it's all about the photo. Um, but... Um, the older, you know, the, the other websites that it's people find it very hard to describe themselves, and that comes very naturally to me. I've been writing in the mainstream of media for 40 years, I've been writing about relationships for 40 years. If I don't know something about what attracts the you know, one sex to the other, and who does, uh, and so I really enjoy that helping people put together information about that. But it's, it, it's not easy. I mean, lots of women, particularly, are delusional about the sort of person they're likely to, that they need and they want in their lives. And I, I think there's this interesting problem with so many women spending a long period single before they even think of settling down. And then they, when they come along to me in their 30s, they, they have this enormous shopping list, which is a compilation of every good quality and every man they've ever been with. And little do they, <laughs> little do they realize they're actually less likely to get that top alpha bloke than they ever were because uh, they've left they've run a bit late in terms of the competition for those most desirable men um, and they you know they don't realize their market value has actually gone down during that period I'm very interested in what happens to women in their 30s and the fact that there's so much being written about where are all the good men you know what's wrong with these men and to me there's a lot of things that are painfully obvious about what's wrong with the women they're too demanding. They have unrealistic expectations. And I can totally understand why a lot of men are running a mile. And you've... Uh, Go, big cow. You know, I mean, I, to me, that's a logical position to take. Uh, if I was a young man, I'd be thinking very seriously about whether marriage was ever in my interest. You've obviously witnessed uh, dating change quite a bit over the years. It used to be the... A dinner party or even the nightclub where um, young couples met but obviously it's it's online mainly these days there's been a massive growth of uh, what's your uh, opinion on this shift has it been for the better or has it uh, unveiled new problems oh look it's problematic but the, I mean the difference is people used to get married in their early 20s right out of school right out of uni that's when they all got together and then it was much easier. Everyone was single. People paired off. You know, lots of people found someone suitable for them. Uh, if we now have a time, we've never had a time in our history where more people are single at different periods of their lives. You know, there, lots of people are still single in their 30s. By the time they hit their 40s, there's people coming out of divorces and so on. Um, so there, and there's nothing better than the internet and the Phone apps and all. I mean, we, we've got this magical opportunity for that those big pools of people to get together. And the minute I heard about online dating, I thought this is fantastic. Um, and I was, you know, newly divorced at the time, and and I went online and I did online dating on and off for seven years and met my partner that way. And I mean, I, it really worked for me. I think it's a fantastic opportunity to give people a chance to connect provided they, they're realistic about it. You know, it's not like if you're buying a house in Sydney, you wouldn't think you'd go out on a Saturday morning and look at three houses and if they didn't work out, you'd give up. You'd realise it was, you know, you had to go out there and you had to go to lots of auctions and you had to keep looking. And finding someone who's compatible with you is infinitely harder than buying a house, um, you know, or buying a refrigerator. People put more time into choosing a fridge or a car than they do into choosing a partner. And that's madness. You know, the difference, the difference is that fridge has to like you too. You don't have to just like it. And that's tricky. The online dating coaching is my day job. Uh, but it's not my passion. I mean, that's, that's how I'm earning a bit of income while I devote myself almost totally to trying to save men. <laughs> and uh, my work in terms of men's rights has become the big um, goal in my life, the big passion in my life, and, and the online dating luckily enables that to be possible because it earns me a bit of income. You don't make any money making video blogs, as you know. 
<laughs> yeah, you've got to still find a way to pay the bills somehow. Yeah. So there you are. But I mean, I, look, the online dating is fun. I really enjoy doing that. I love talking to people. I love helping people. And, you know, I'm a very romantic soul deep down. And so, I've, you know, when people end up meeting someone and, that, you know, and getting married or s settling down together, I find that very thrilling. So it's fun. Now, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, the modern man. Now, most people uh, have this perception that men are better off today. I mean, for example, there's more discussion about men's mental health. There's uh, Are You OK Day, uh, Beyond Blue, that was you know founded with men's mental health in mind. Then there's the Movember uh, promotion and also men are encouraged to open up more with their you know feelings you know not uh, uh, bottle it all up um, uh, what's your perception or response when um, uh, that type of analysis is put to you um, it's an interesting question I, I think probably men are will work better off in the 1950s in actual fact, I mean, I think men are in a terrible place at the moment. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. the one at one area which, where I would make an exception that in terms of this expressing their feelings and and, and not being in lock, as locked into the sort of masculine role that denied them true intimacy with their in their relationships, particularly with their children. I mean, that has been a big plus, no question. Um, but that is a two-edged sword. I mean, it really bothers me that men, as never before, are encouraged to embrace fatherhood and to see that as a hugely important thing, which it is. It's the most wonderful thing. And yet it's never been so vulnerable. I mean, men can take on the role of fathers and find it the most rewarding thing in their lives. And then two months, six months, two years later, have the rug pulled out from under them where, the, where the part, their partner, their wife decides she doesn't want to be in the relationship anymore and they have to fight to see their children. And that is a tragedy of epic proportions. And it's across our society. And I suppose I was, that's what's got me into this whole business of men's rights. Um, probably for the last 30 years, I've been battling on the issue of how unfair it is that children are deprived of their fathers and what a, tra you know, that, that's been a really destructive thing for our society. Um, but overall, I think in many ways, men had it better in previous generations when they were given respect for what they did. Men are doing the same jobs as they've always done, working as hard, if not harder than they've always done. But there used to be this quaint notion that the women would be grateful, the women would give thanks to them for that. Oh, here comes dad. I mean, we should all be good to dad because he's had a hard day at the office. Let's look after him. You know, this notion that he was the sort of conquering hero because he'd worked hard for them. Men are still doing that. But now they just get constant criticism. They get no thanks whatsoever. They get totally told that she works twice as hard as they do anyway. I mean, I think... Marriage for men is really a mug's game and a very risky prospect, and as are most live-in live relationships. And yet, of course, men, I think lots of men, love having a, a wife, a partner, someone in their lives that they commit themselves to. Um, and the happiest men are men are in happy marriages, but that's, whoa, is that winning the lotto? Uh, I think one of the um, disadvantages we've seen uh, for men in this modern age is that there's this uh, new suspicion of, of them, especially around children that, uh, I mean, I've seen probably uh, off had you know, every couple of months saying, you know, men should not be uh, left alone uh, with uh, children. And there's uh, a lot of men who say that they don't become, you know, teachers or childcare workers because, you know, they're, uh, they're worried they'll be accused of, you know, being uh, predatory. Uh, uh, that's something that I think, you know, modern men uh, have really uh, suffered with. Oh, yeah, absolutely, the issue around children. And that's been, you know, that's a shocking thing, that we are systematically driving men out of education and out of working with children in any capacity. 
Um, no man is right mind would want to be with a, a classroom of five-year-olds. Uh, it's just too risky for him. Um, you know, whether, whatever it is, nursing, a whole range of occupations are, are really dangerous for men because they can so easily get accused of, you know, inappropriate behaviour towards children, but also inappropriate behaviour towards women. I mean, this latest Me Too, hashtag Me Too campaign is showing up women's vindictiveness and stupidity as nothing we have ever seen before. And what is becoming patently obvious is that men should avoid working with women because they're not to be trusted because they can be accused of telling a joke, making an inappropriate remark, looking at a woman in the wrong way 20 years later and having their career ruined. And I mean, gee, how stupid are women? Here we fought for the right to get into the workplace alongside men. And now we're just blowing it all sky high. But teach, by teaching men, they're nuts to work. If they have a choice between employing a man and a woman, they, if they have any sense whatsoever, they should choose the man now. And I'm also curious about, obviously, with the age of the internet, we've seen the explosion uh, of the availability of uh, pornography, which is mainly consumed by uh, men. Has that uh, damaged... Uh, relationships between or sexual relationships between men and women um well it, it need to do so but of course within the feminist movement with you know the women are working really hard to use that as a weapon against men there's always been pornography if you go back to the cavemen there was you know there were always men have always liked images of sexual images of women Col one, you know, cultures across the world have some erotic component, uh, visual component that has been particularly enjoyed by men, stick figures or the Victorians used to have play cards. Or I, I, I did a lot of work. I did a work, uh, a um, research project on looking at male and female differences in sexual desire a few years ago and talked to a lot of men about these issues. And one man said to me he used to leap on the Sunday paper in the hope that it would have a, Kmart catalogue in there so he could look at women in underwear. I mean, this is, we know this. Men like looking at sexy bodies. Men like looking at sexy images. Women are more likely to want to have something that has a plot, you know, the, the Fifty Shades of Grey. I mean, the, our erotic imagination, if we even have one, um, is, is very different from the men's. And so what do we have? Of course, we have women saying that men's, erotica, men's pornography is bad, wicked, you know, addictive, dangerous, turning them into sex crave monsters, whereas, you know, what we do, of course, is perfect. And I mean, look at when Fifty Shades of Grey came out. There were therapists across the world saying, oh, no, 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 women, don't, that doesn't mean women are interested in, in being tied up and whipped. You know, women have a capacity to differentiate between real life and fantasy, and this is just fantasy. And, but, of course, that doesn't apply to men, does it? Men, you know, assume that when they look at images of, you know, unrealistic images of busty blondes and so on, that's what they want. They're denigrating women and, 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 and that's influencing the way they think about women. It's just nuts. We have had generations of women, now, of young men now, exposed to internet porn, my sons included, and all their friends, who are all ter totally normal young men who treat women with great respect. It hasn't perverted their relationships. It hasn't turned them into sex crazed monsters. But, you know, the woe betide the, the man who's caught late at night looking at it, you know, she thinks he's looking at his computer and he's actually looking at something sexy because that could just blow up the way we're talking about it now. Uh, pornography is one of the areas where it's just full of misinformation and, and anti-male propaganda. And, I mean, I, given going back to my sex therapy um, background, one of the things that really bothers me is what's coming out in, in that area and in the Me Too campaigns is an anti-sex campaign driven by women because one of the big problems we have, which I've been writing about a lot over the years, is a growing gap between men and women in terms of sexual desire. 
All the research is showing that men are much more likely to maintain their interest in sex in long-term relationships than women are. Lots and lots of women go off sex. It's just not interesting to them. And so we have a hell of a lot of women out there who are essentially anti-sex, who hate the fact that men continue to have this lovely, rampant, exuberant sexual drive and are doing their best to denigrate that and repress it. And, you know, be buggered if I'm not going to get out there and fight that. I mean, I was fighting the anti-sex conservatives 40 years ago, and now it's the left wing, the feminists, who are leading this charge to label male sexuality as a perverted thing. I wanted to turn to now the, the modern woman. Now, women are considered these days to have been liberated. Like, for example, they no longer have to you know, give up work when they're married, you know, have to be stay-at-home uh, mothers. They're, they're now in control of their uh, sex lives. You know, marital rape is, is no longer uh, tolerated. But uh, what's the uh, reality? I mean, has women's happiness improved over the past 50 years? Well, of course, this is the funny thing that women's happiness, if you look at the research, women's happiness is actually de decreasing. Um, but I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not one to say women were better off in the 1950s. I don't think they were. I think the choices that are available for women are fabulous. Uh, we've, we've got options that we never had before. And many of us have benefited enormously from that. I mean, certainly my life has been blessed by having the opportunity to have children and also work throughout my life and do really fulfilling work and doing things that I wouldn't people in previous generations wouldn't have been allowed to do and having very different relationships with the men in my life from the you know more equal relationships and I think that is important that you know uh, that women don't have to defer to men and women can be part of the decision making in the family and so on um, so you know, I'd be the first to applaud the good things about women's liberation. I was a feminist, in my, you know, for many years. It's only very recently I've stopped calling myself a feminist um, because I believed in equality between men and women. And I think we've achieved that, um, no question, in lots of areas. And it really bothers me that now the feminist movement has decided to go well beyond that into grinding men into the dirt. They're not interested in equality. They're interested in disadvantaging men in every conceivable area of their lives. And that's not why I became a feminist. Um, and so but going back to my question, the, your original question, I think it's a very complex issue of why women are unhappy. I think a lot of it's to do with totally unrealistic expectations. They've been given about their lives, the assumption that they, you know, that they can... Um, easily combine raising children and looking after children with having a career. It's, it's just the fact that it, it's, it's not so easy. There's no question that children, many children, are being denied the, the care they need by being put into long hours of childcare from a very early age. I've done a lot of work on that and writing about that. And too many children are getting minimalist parenting as a result of being brought up in two career families. There has to be some slack in the system. It could be a man or a woman, but you can't have two brain surgeons in the family. And, and you know, women somehow don't, you know, that, that's a very difficult thing to negotiate in a relationship. Who is it who's going to put the extra time and care into being there for the kids? Uh, and clearly that's something, one of the, the great areas of tension for women. And they would argue, well, why isn't it an area of tension for men too? Um, I think it is, but in a different way. I think there are lots of men who like more flexibility in terms of being there for their children. Uh, but often they're the ones earning the greater incomes and the mortgage is dependent on what they do and they think they're doing the right things for their family in continuing to work really hard to, to support that family. And they discover, of course, when they get divorced, that none of that counts at all in terms of contact with their kids. Um, so it's complex. Um, and, uh, but I think there are lots of reasons why women are discovering it's extremely difficult to get it right. 
And probably the most important one is that they are endlessly disappointed in their relationships because they have a totally unrealistic view of what they can get from this one person, the, the man they choose to share their lives with. And men just can't come up to, to scratch. It's just impossible to give women what they want. Well, one of the things I've seen you comment on quite a bit is the uh, prominence of uh, single women in their 30s now, professional uh, women who who can't find a man, and it's uh, there's endless um, you know, f- uh, female lifestyle websites commenting on this. Uh, probably, you know, Bridget Jones is the embodiment of uh, this problem. Uh, how is this? Uh, fi- uh, how would you say? this can be fixed or how can, how can this be um, uh, amended? Well, I think it's really problematic because what we've got there is the consequence of women making the decision, mainly women, I think, making the decision to delay marriage. And we, we, we used to get married until we were in our early 20s. Now most women, most men and women don't decide to settle down until their late 20s. 20s and it just gives it gives men all the choice i mean if you all get all partner up in your early 20s as i said earlier there's you know there's this idea that there's probably going to be someone for everybody pretty much but leave men out there into their 30s and they could choose to partner women much younger than them you know the professional men could choose to partner up with less qualified women uh, so the 35-year-old lawyer who wants another 35-year-old lawyer or a man who's equally successful as she is, uh, is fishing in a very sparsely, um, a very sparse pool of professional men who have all the choices in the world. And she's hopping mad because a lot of those men aren't interested in her. But how, who could blame them? I mean, you know, I think if I was a 39-year-old professional man, I would be thinking about a considerably younger woman because the whole pressure around quickly deciding whether you want to partner up, quickly deciding whether you want to have children can, you know, just be really killing for a relationship. You want a bit of time and to, to sort out whether you're, you're right for each other um, rather than, you know, partnering up and immediately getting into the panic of do we start IVF today you know I think all of that is extremely hard I have clients who are in their women who are in their 30s and they have some of my most difficult clients because they're really facing those issues now I want to turn now to your most recent research which you've done a lot about the the truth of uh, domestic violence which has become one of these uh, sacred cows in Australian politics. No mainstream Australian politician will dare question that there's a domestic violence uh, epidemic but um, uh, through your uh, publications you've said it's you know it's it's not as straightforward as it's being made out. It's an issue that affects both uh, women uh, and men. Yes, well, I mean, it's certainly not my research. It's research. We've got 40 years of research showing that. There, there was a, a, a big compilation of all that research done a few years ago, which, which included 1,700 peer-reviewed papers, um, meta-analyses, you know, compilations of enormous amount of research uh, which shows that most domestic violence is two-way violence involving women as well as men it's not about respect for women it's not about dangerous men attacking women that is a minority of the a tiny proportion of the the cases of domestic violence that are actually witnessed and i mean it's the most fascinating area because if you ask men and women, particularly 10 years ago, when most the data started being collected in Australia, if you ask men and women who's a victim of violence, most men would say, no, I haven't been, because there was an enormous amount of shame associated with the idea of being beaten up by your wife or partner. Um, so you tend to get many more women saying they were victims than, than men. Then I'll go out and ask men and women, who are the perpetrators? Have you ever hit anybody? Women will Usually, I mean, often the, the research shows very clearly that women will, in that circumstance, acknowledge they do it as much as men, if not more. 
And researchers across the world have been gobsmacked by that, really surprised to find young women, women of all ages, admitting that they've slugged a guy. Um, I was watching, you know, that TV show, that Suits, about the lawyers, it's called Suits. I, I was just been working my way, binging on that, watch, working my way through it. So far, I've got seven women who slapped men in the face. And it's treated as a great joke. And that was only made in the last few years. It's, it's just amazing how there's no censure whatsoever towards women abusing men. And yet we see it everywhere. Everybody knows it's happening. I, I mean, I've been writing, as you say, I've been writing about this for years now. I get letters all the time from women who, and women, men and women who say, I grew up with a violent mother. Uh, my brother's wife is an ice addict. I mean, everybody knows there are violent women out there and we're not allowed to talk about them. And it's just shameful. The misinformation, the lies we are being told about domestic violence. I, I think this is one of the most shameful lies perpetrated by feminists, the, the fact that they've managed to absolutely capture the dialogue around domestic violence and totally control it. So we have, you know, everyone from Malcolm Turnbull down saying lie, domestic violence is all about respect for women. We have millions of dollars being spent on horrible ads depicting little boys as violent and little girls as eternally innocent. Everybody watching that ad knows it's ridiculous. And yet it goes on. And we have this massive bureaucracies out there promoting misinformation about domestic violence and being paid for by us. You said at the beginning, Tim, that there's no one challenging this. Well, there is one person, which is David Lionhelm, who and we have to give enormous credit to the Senator Lionhelm. He's been in there at Senate Estimates, the committee, getting putting the bureaucrats on notice saying, What's the evidence for this ridiculous te television campaign? What's the evidence that domestic violence is all about, uh, you know, disrespect for women? Uh, he's been calling them out on their lies every time he goes before them. And I hope we'll next year manage to get some more people on board trying to do that. So is that where most of the money goes, uh, advertising and awareness? Because Oh, no. Most of the money goes into employing thousands of female bureaucrats whose jobs depend on this lie, whose whole job, you know, is about, you know, people running the right women campaigns, people running these, there's lots and lots of organisations which are all about domestic violence and their job is perpetrating, spreading propaganda, misinformation. And they're doing a brilliant job and boy, are they a mighty industry to take on. Because I do read uh, some of the, the feminist uh, blogs and they, they, they always say if there's the slightest cut in, you know, funding to, you know, women's organisations, then, oh, we'll have to, you know, shut down a uh, domestic violence shelter, we'll have to, you know, shut down a, a helpline. Yeah, as if. I mean, that's the thing. The, the, the hundreds of millions of dollars that Malcolm Turnbull boasts around, hardly any of that is going to shelters. I mean... You, you can always argue more money needs to be there at the coal face, but most of it is going into people who are promoting misinformation. No question. I could give you the stats on that. And uh, one of the other issues you've um, spoken about uh, this year, and it's it, it's a phenomenon that's um, uh, confused me quite a bit. It's the university uh, rape epidemic, which it started off in the, the United States. There was that documentary, the, the Hunting Ground, but it's come to Australia with the uh, report released earlier this year by the um, Human Rights Commission about um, sexual harassment and assault on university campuses. Now, this um, uh, study, it was so easy to like debunk, like I only looked at it for a few hours and I was able to, you know, pick out all the holes in it. But why has, uh, I, I want to ask you, why has the university like uh, become, you know, this, you know, battleground for, you know, uh, uh, this issue? I mean, um, you know, obviously university educated men are more likely to be on the on the feminist side. So why do you know the feminist lobby? Why do they pick on you know men who who, who go to university? Well, it's a deliberate campaign. It's, it's right up there with the domestic violence campaign, as a means of um, 
you know, really, well, I'll tell you where it all comes from. It comes from the fact that the, there's an assumption by the feminists that we don't get enough rape convictions. And it is true, particularly in cases that are likely to occur on campus when you've got a young man and a woman, they're usually pissed. And it's a he says, she says. You know, he, he claim, she claims he didn't stop when she asked him to stop and he says, yeah, so on. And those cases won't get convicted in court. So if a woman go, accuses a man in that situation of rape, goes to court, our very sensible juries of ordinary people will turn around and say, oh, there's not enough evidence to put that man in jail. I'm not going to convict him, quite rightly. Um, oh, there's, you know, that there's this text she sent to him after the so-called rape where she said, I'd love to see you again. And they'll take into account all that stuff and they won't convict the guy. Um, so what the feminists decide they're not enough rape convictions, that's what this whole fake campus rape epidemic is all about, trying to get in these sexual consent cases, get, trying to get more convictions by taking it out of the hands of the criminal law system and putting it in the hands of, of judicial, you know, semi-judicial bodies. Like in America, they set up uh, tribunals across America. Obama, President Obama did that decreed that all publicly funded universities had to have tribunals to try these men it was a totally different standard of proof uh, often where the men weren't even given details of the allegations we had no capacity to rep have lawyers represent them and now what's happening in america is the universities are on their knees fighting off hundreds literally hundreds of wrongful uh accus you know cases where boys, young men have been accused of rape and and thrown out of the universities and ended their education and are now being the families are now suing the universities for the fact that, that they didn't properly allow the, the due process to occur in those legal cases. Now that's exactly what they're trying to achieve here and the hilarious thing is they conned the Human Rights Commission into spending a million dollars of our money to try to prove there was a rape crisis on campus and they came up with nothing. Point, I can't remember what it was now, 0.7% of our Aussie students, female students, said they'd had some sort of sexual assault, not even on campus. It included travelling to and from from the uni with, with people who weren't even at the uni, it could include any incident involving a student with anybody else. That's the best they could come up with. Absolute proof we don't have a great crisis on campus. And what are the universities and what does the media turn around and say, oh, well, there's a lot of sexual harassment, um, which turned out to be mainly staring. So girls who go along to uni in their gorgeous little short shorts or their minis or whatever it is, or um, get stared at, which is hardly surprising, and they object to it. I mean, come on, give me a break. But the fact that our universities, our vice chancellors are parading around, perpetuating the notion that there is this rape crisis on campus, putting off overseas students, you know, these the, the families in India and China and so on who are sending their kids to Australia, why would they send their kids to Australia if there really was a rape crisis on our campuses? I mean, it's all nonsensical, but it's just another example of where feminism, today's feminism, is leading us. And one of the area, places it's leading us in terms of universities is creating universities as unsafe places for young men where they're at risk of being wrongly accused of sexual assault. I've got a young man in a university in Australia who's fighting one of one of these cases just in the last few months, he's got being required to appear before a student committee to answer rape charges. I mean, this is a criminal offence, and yet students are wandering around thinking that they can ask this guy questions about his behaviour on the basis of a supposed allegation. I mean, the whole thing is totally nuts. Uh, you touched on it uh, briefly about the uh, role of uh, fatherhood. Now, uh, obviously, the, the rights of fathers is uh, not well respected, well, 
uh, not just in Australia, but uh, anywhere in the uh, the West, the, the family court is hugely biased uh, uh, against men. And there's, you know, been countless stories of men who uh, completely have been cut off uh, uh, from, uh, from contact from uh, their children, yet they're forced to pay these absorbent uh, child support um, uh, payments. Uh, how can the, this bias be, be overcome? Because uh, there was a move during the Howard government to you know, correct this uh, bias in the family uh, law system, but it, but it seems to be ingrained in the, the culture of the family court that it's, that, that it's men who are always starting from the losing position. Mm. I mean, I was in, very much involved in all of this in the Howard era. And on, funnily enough, I found myself on government committees representing men uh, because some of the Howard people were concerned that the way committees were structured, often the men from the men's groups weren't a good match for the really powerful women's groups. I mean, I've always been interested in this, the fact that people find it's very hard to get the really well-educated professional men to join men's groups uh, and fight for men's rights or father's rights or uh, because they tend to just fight their battles on their own paying expensive lawyers to do you know to go to family court for them they don't want to be associated with a bunch of losers I mean that to me this is one of the critical issues around not only family law issues but a whole range of men's rights issues is where are the part so-called powerful men who are running our society, why aren't they looking after men's rights? Uh, but in this case, I found myself on these committees trying to do something uh, to represent men. I mean, we, I was on a committee to do with re reforming the child support formula. Uh, if you think it's bad now, you should have seen it before then, uh, because there used to be no recognition whatsoever that it actually costs money to look after a child, even if you're a non-custodial parent, even if you have that child two days a week, you still need a bedroom. You still, and we, we actually work quite hard to try to adjust the formula to include some of those costs. You're never going to get it right. And of course, what inevitably happens is, um, it, you know, if there's a, a money that kicks in when a man has a woman, has the kids stand, stay with them for two days a week, women will stop allowing the children to stay with him for two days a week uh, because that means she loses income. And I mean, it's just an enormously difficult area. Uh, and I agree about the, you know, it is right about the issue of um, um, men naturally being resentful of paying money for children they don't see. Um, and yet it, that, that's a very difficult relationship because I mean if you're not seeing your ch children there's still your responsibility and if you want to have a relationship with your children the best thing you can possibly do is be able to prove that you've always cared about them by continuing to support them and continuing to fight to be able to see them uh, but I spend half my life talking to men in that situation about the frust you know enormous frustration of being unable to even talk to their kids let alone spend real time to them. So th this whole area is a nightmare. I used to write about it all the time. It just, I find it so depressing. Um, and the thousands and thousands of men who've written to me in that situation just break my heart. Um, I haven't totally given up and occasionally I go back to looking at family law issues when I get so furious about something that I can't resist. Um, but, I mean, in so many ways, it got better for a while. John Howard made some significant changes. And then, of course, when Labor got in, the Labor won that all back. People listening to this need to know that the Labor Party is absolutely captured by the lone parent organisations, the lone mums, and they are never going to do anything to reform family law. Um, liberals have been shocking recently, um, but... At least, if you look at the history of our various political parties, within the Liberals are people who are genuinely concerned about this issue and want to do something about it. And we're just putting more, we need to put more pressure on them to get moving again, to shore up some of the advances that were made under previous Liberal governments. Well, I've certainly enjoyed your insights today, Bettina. So thank you uh, for sharing your uh, expertise and perspective. And of course, I look forward to continuing to see your uh, research and analysis in the media.
and I hope people will listen to my YouTube. I've only just started making YouTube vlogs and uh, I hope I'm, I'm wanting to encourage people to have a look at that and also maybe support me if they think I'm doing a good job. Thanks very much. No worries. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. A reminder about our end of year Unshackler Awards. Uh, this is a series of 10 awards with uh, 10 nominees in each category where we uh, reward the best and uh, worst contributions to uh, the political debate in 2017. So far, the categories that are open for voting are the Regressive of the Year and the Australian Patriot of the Year. So make sure that you head on over to uh, cast your vote. And of course, don't forget that The Unshackled is uh, still around during the Christmas and holiday period. So make sure you uh, keep checking out uh, The Unshackled website. And of course, we'll still be uh, releasing Unshackled Waves episodes. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.